Y'all get your Bibles. Turn them to Luke chapter 3. Luke chapter 3. Luke chapter 3. We're going to uh, look at this whole chapter today, Luke chapter 3. But I want to start by telling you something about Judge Judy. You all like Judge Judy? Come on, man, Judge Judy is awesome. Okay, uh, do you all ever watch Judge Judy? It's just, for me, I mean, I'm, I'm never, I was never really home whenever it was on, but I enjoy watching clips of Judge Judy. It, to me, it's just, uh, it's prime time entertainment. Uh, the, the drama and just the stupidity of people, uh, and it just, I, I love it. I, I love uh, Judge Judy. And I, th- for those that, that don't know, I mean, Judge Judy's not a real judge. She's not, you know, handing out sentences or anything like that. Uh, all of this is drama. Literally, you can go make money if you want to. You can go manufacture drama in your life and sign up for Judge Judy and go, Okay. But I, I was watching a clip the other day of, the, of, of this show, and it was a paternity episode. Y'all ever seen those? You know, like the dad, that's not my son, right? Okay, so there's this man claiming that he is not the father, and there's this woman claiming that he is. And they're arguing back and forth, and, and the man is saying, I haven't seen this girl in years, yada, yada, yada. He's probably much more derogatory than girl, okay? Um, but uh, I haven't seen her in years. There's no way that this is my child, uh, <laughs> blah, blah, blah. And I'm not joking. They cut the camera. The kid is there, okay? They cut the camera to this kid. And, I mean, if this kid is not his son then Iris is not my daughter, okay? <laughs> I, I'm not, I mean, he was a spitting image. I mean, he looked just like the dad. It's, it was so comical because he's like, no, that's not my kid. And they just cut the camera to this guy. And I mean, I, he could not look any more like the dad. Despite it being obvious that this child is his, he refuses to admit uh, admit it in an attempt to get out of paying child support, or I don't know. Maybe he manufactured. The, maybe they were hard up for money, and so they said, "Hey, let's uh, let's have a paternity struggle and go on Judge Judy and create some drama for people." I don't know. Thankfully, thankfully, we do not have to wonder about the progeny of our only Savior, God's Son, Jesus the Christ. That is, in fact, what Luke chapter three is about. Luke chapter, in Luke chapter 3, we will see John the Baptist's preparation for the coming Messiah, Jesus, and God's proclamation from heaven that Jesus is indeed His Son, and then Luke's genealogy showing Jesus' progeny as the Messiah, the Son of God. That's what we're going to notice uh, in Luke chapter 3 today. And uh, this is an essential teaching. It's essential that the gospel writers spend a little bit of time talking about uh, the sonship of Jesus, the fact that Jesus is God's son. It's essential because it's essential that God came to rescue mankind from the mess that they had gotten themselves into. That was an essential doctrine of God's word. It was an essential teaching for us to get because Israel and all mankind by extension had a rebellion problem on their hands. And God's plan to fix it was to send His only begotten Son to sort it out. And so it's essential that Luke spend a portion of his gospel saying, Jesus was God's Son. This is what happened surrounding the proclamation that, that, that Jesus was God's son, and this is what I want you to know. Okay, So we do not have any doubts about the paternity of Jesus. But I, I want us to go back and think about Israel for a moment. If you turn your Bibles over to Deuteronomy, put a, put a marker there at Luke chapter 3. Okay, If you still have uh, a ribbon there, I, mean, I think you can even put a digital ribbon on your uh, phone if you want to. Put a ribbon there at... Uh, Luke chapter 3, go over with me to the fifth book of the Bible, Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy. 
Deuteronomy is the fifth book in your Bible. It, it means second law. It is the second time that God told his law. Deuteronomy chapter 28 is where we're going. Deuteronomy chapter 28. We have in Deuteronomy 28 the blessing and the cursing. God tells his people Israel, if you do these things, I will bless you. But if you don't do these things, I will curse you. I want you to notice uh, verses 15 through 19. It says, but if you will not obey the voice of the Lord your God or be careful to do all his commandments and his statutes that I command you today, then all these curses shall come upon you and overtake you. Cursed shall you be in the city and cursed shall you be in the field. Cursed shall your basket and your kneading bowl. Cursed shall be the fruit of your womb and the fruit of your ground, the increase of your herds and the young of your flock. Cursed shall you be when you come in and cursed shall you be when you go out. Drop uh, down to verses 36 through 44. The Lord will bring you and your king whom he, you set over you to, to a nation that neither you nor your fathers have known. He's telling them, if you continue to disobey me, you will go into captivity. Okay? You will go into captivity. And there you shall serve other gods of wood and stone. And you shall become a horror, a proverb, and a byword among all the peoples where the Lord will lead you away. And you shall carry much seed into the field and shall gather in little, for the locust shall consume it. And you shall plant vineyards and dress them, but you shall neither drink the, of the wine nor gather of the grapes, for the worm shall eat them. You shall have olive trees throughout all your territory, but you shall not anoint yourself with the oil, for your olives shall drop off. You shall father sons and daughters, but they shall not be yours. For they shall go into captivity. The cricket shall possess all your trees and the fruit of your ground. The sojourner who is among you shall rise higher and higher above you, and you shall come down lower and lower, and he shall lend to you, and you shall not lend to him, and he shall be the head, and you shall be the tail. Okay. Now go over to Deuteronomy chapter 30, a couple chapters later, verses 1 through 3. Deuteronomy 30. And when all of these things come upon you, the blessing and the cursing, which I have set before you, and you call them to mind among all the nations where the Lord your God has driven you, and return to the Lord your God, you and your children, and obey his voice, all that I command you today, with all your heart and with all your soul, then the Lord your God will restore your fortunes and have mercy on you and will gather you again from all the peoples where the Lord your God has scattered you. Okay? So all the way back in Deuteronomy, God warns them, if you don't obey my law, if you don't do what I ask you, if you don't keep your covenant with me, it's going to be bad, okay? You're going to be cursed. It's going to be bad. You're going to be driven away into captivity. You're going to be scattered abroad into captivity. But then he says, even though that is the case, even though you didn't keep my covenant, even though you cheated on me multiple times, and did not keep my covenant, even though that is the case, I will still bless you and bring you back in and forgive you and have mercy upon you. And that as you read the Old Testament, that's exactly what happens. They did not obey God. They had kings. They had the northern kingdom with 19 kings, all bad. They had the southern kingdom with 20 kings. Only eight of them were good. And God eventually sent them away into captivity, but eventually brought them back. And so Israel was punished for evil and idolatry by going away into slavery, returned from the slavery to rebuild the wall and the temple, but ultimately, because of Greek and Roman rule, they were still slaves in their own land. They were, for the most part, no longer idolatrous. They weren't worshiping idols anymore like they were before, but still very wicked in God's sight. And they needed a rescuer, a savior, a judge, a reformer. They were under the thumb of Roman rule. And they had been waiting for an Elijah-like figure who had been prophesied to prepare the way for the king who would set things right. That's, they were anticipating this. Okay? They were waiting for uh, a, an Elijah-like figure like the Old Testament talks about to come and prepare the way for the Messiah who would rescue them. They had waited so long. They had been away into slavery, they had come back, they had rebuilt things, but they were still basically slaves in their own land. 
and they were waiting on God. And so that brings us to Luke chapter 3. That brings us to Luke chapter 3. And we're going to notice the preparation for the Son of God. The preparation for the Son of God in verses 1 through 20. Luke chapter 3, starting with verse 1. Verses 1 and 2, he's going to give you the setting of what's going on. In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, and Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip, tetrarch of the region of Iturea and Trachonitis, and uh, Lysanias, tetrarch of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John the son of Zechariah in the wilderness. Okay, so you have all these characters here. Remember, we talked about Luke. He's like an investigative journalist, okay? He, he was not present for these things. Luke was not among the 12 disciples. He wasn't there. And so he's going and he's researching these things. He's hearing stories. He's finding out. And so he's done research to find out when these things were happening. So first of all, we have Ti- Tiberius Caesar. Now, Caesar Augustus, all right, the most famous Caesar, except, well, Julius probably is the most famous. Augustus came in after Julius Caesar. Augustus is really, what sta- is really who started the Roman Empire. Okay? Tiberius Caesar was Augustus' replacement. Augustus died in 14 AD, and Tiberius was his successor. And Luke says this was in the 15th year of Tiberius' reign. So that puts it at year 29. All right? That's the year. 29 AD. Pilate, he talks about Pilate. Pilate was governor of Judea from 26 AD to 36 AD. We have uh, the Pilate Stone. You can uh, look that up, Google that, and it'll tell you he was governor of the region from 26 AD to 36 AD. They found that um, in, uh, in that region. All right, so he's into his third year of being governor. You know, he's still in the, in the, uh, in the honeymoon phase. Okay, people still kind of like him, right? But it's about to get bad for him. All right. Herod, we have Herod. This is not Herod the Great that uh, tried to have Jesus killed. This is his son. Now, Herod the Great that tried to have Jesus killed, he had 10 wives and 15 children. Okay? 10 wives, 15 children. But many of those children he had murdered. Okay? Imagine that. All right? I mean, I, you know, oh, Dad, I love you. And he just kills you, okay? Uh, He had them murdered because he feared that they would take his throat. Very nasty, disgusting man. Um, Two that did not get murdered ended up being part of a tetrarchy or four rulers, okay, of the region. Uh, One of those is Herod, this that's talking about here, the Herod Antipas, all right? And then another son was Philip, that's Antipas's brother, all right? And then it talks about Lysanias, relatively unimportant ruler of an unimportant region called Abilene. Not Abilene, Texas. That's very important. Um, All right, and then we have Annas and Caiaphas. Annas is the father-in-law of Caiaphas. And Caiaphas Caiaphas served as high priest from 18 A.D. to 36 A.D. Okay, so that's the setting. That's the setting for you. Now, I want you to notice the call, verses 3, or uh, the the end of verse 2 through 6. The word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. And he went into all the region around Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As it is written, the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be lifted and every mountain shall be made low and the crooked shall become straight and the rough places shall become level ways and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. John the Baptist has his call as the one who's going to prepare the way. If uh, you notice the the you, you may notice in your Bible that there is a quote a quotation of a passage from the Old Testament. It has a different uh, notation here. It's usually put in poetic uh, form. This is a quotation from Isaiah chapter forty verses three through five. But if you were to go back to Isaiah chapter forty, you would notice verse one. Isaiah says, "Comfort, comfort, comfort my people." Comfort, comfort, comfort my people. This was to be uh, the announcement of the return from captivity. That's what Isaiah 40 is talking about. But Israel had returned from captivity 400 years ago, right? Well, that's the point here. They really hadn't returned from captivity. 
They had returned and they had been able to build the temple and they had been able to rebuild the wall, but they were still under uh, Greek and Roman rule. For years, for hundreds of years, they were still basically slaves in their own land. This is the real time when they would be released from captivity. And so John comes and he's preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Now, it's, it's odd uh, here to talk about this because we really don't read about anything about baptism in the Old Testament. Okay? Uh, though there is much about ritual cleansing, which was the precursor for baptism, if you want to look that up and, and study that, Leviticus 16, verses 4, 24, 26, and 28 are all about uh, ritual cleansing in the Old Testament. This is something that's new to the people. It's something, uh, baptism is something that only really came about uh, and, and until the, it didn't really come about until the intertestament period. The time between Malachi and Matthew, that's when they started to have ritual cleansings, ritual baptisms. Immersion for ritual purity became a practice in that time period, the intertestamental uh, period. And people would dip themselves in a vertical bath called a mikvah. Okay? You can actually go to the uh, Biblical History Center here in town, and there at the entrance, they have a mikvah. You can go see one. It's a, it's, it's a skinny thing, and you just kind of step down into it and, and, and uh, go all the way down in the water. And they, people during that time, they would baptize themselves. They wouldn't get baptized. They would go baptize themselves. They would dip down into the water. And so he preaches this baptism of repentance for the remission of sins, something that's, that's new for the people. No longer is it just a ritual cleansing of cleansing their flesh. He wants people to start thinking about cleansing their lives, their souls. And so then with this happening, he preaches a sermon. I want you to listen to his preaching, verses 7 through 9. He said, therefore, to the crowds that came out to be baptized by him, you brood of vipers. Y'all want a sermon like that? You want me to call you vipers and punks, jerks? Y'all you know, want me to do that? I mean, I, I think we're due for a hellfire and brimstone sermon, aren't we? Are we due for a John the Baptist sermon? Maybe, maybe one day, I don't know. We, we may be due for a John the Baptist sermon. He calls them brood of vipers. Who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruits in keeping with repentance. And do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. It's a hard sermon. That's... A hard sermon. He tells them, I want you to repent. I want you to repent. I want you to change your life in such a way that it's visible, there's fruit. Because God is coming to judge. You need to change. He's telling Israel, the Israelites, okay, he's telling them, look, yes, you came back from captivity, but you are still a wicked people. You are still a wicked people and you've got to change because the king is coming. The king is coming. And he says, don't you even think to rely on your earthly ancestry or heritage or standing in life. If God cared about that, he would turn stones into people of great ancestry, ancestry and heritage and standing. Who do you think I am? I'm Abraham's child. He says, no, that's not going to get you by. Just because you descend from Abraham, just because you're uh, from uh, the, a descendant of Abraham, just because of your family standing, just because of your name, doesn't mean you're going to get by. Everybody, high and low, short and tall, hairy and bald, rich and poor, you got to repent. You got to change. There are no exceptions. There are no exceptions. Well, I want you to notice their response. Okay? If you had a sermon preached to you like that, okay, where the preacher stood up here and he said, you are a viper. You're a snake. 
You're a slithery, slimy. Y'all ever smelled a snake? They don't smell good. Okay, they're nasty. All right, that's how I found out we had a snake in our house one time. I smelled it before I saw it. Okay, you are a slithery, slimy snake. Something that from the very beginning of Jewish history was detested. That's what he says to them. What's your response going to be if someone says that to you? Probably, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I probably wouldn't like it very much. I'd probably have my feelings hurt a little bit. My, my toes stepped on again, but he says it. He says it. And the people respond, verses 10 through 14. The crowds asked him, what then shall we do? And he answered them, whoever has two tunics is to share with him who has none. And whoever has, whoever has food is to do likewise. Interesting response. It wasn't about, uh, you know, seemingly uh, you need to give more, okay? You need, to, uh, you need to make sure your contributions at the temple are bigger. You need to uh, make sure that you attend more festivals and feasts. I noticed that you guys haven't been to Jerusalem for Passover in a long time. You need to do that. No, no, no. It was, hey, you need, to be, you need to be a good person. You need to share with other people. Be kind to other people. Well, some, some people specifically have some questions. Verse 12, tax collectors also came to be baptized and said to him, teacher, what shall we do? And he said to them, collect no more than you were authorized to do. A common practice among tax collectors in the day. Rome asked for their penny and the tax collector would, tax collector would say, you needed to give a little bit more. Don't do that, John says. Collect no more than you were authorized to do. Soldiers also asked him, and we, what shall we do? And he said to them, do not extort money from anyone by threats or by false accusation, and be content with your wages. Okay? Seemingly, there were probably other groups. Those are the two groups that ask questions, and we have, uh, we have uh, record of tax collectors and s- soldiers. But he tells them, look, you, you can't do what you've done before. You can't, be, uh, you can't be a viper. You can't be a slithery, slimy person. Start taking care of people and being good to other people and stop mistreating them. You need to change because Jesus is coming. Which brings us to verse 15. The people were in expectation. They, they've been waiting on this moment. They knew from the time that they were children, someone like Elijah, some wild man who's out in the wilderness. Okay, that's what John the Baptist is. Other places says he wears camel's hair and eats wild, uh, eats honey and locusts. Okay, he's a wild man. They were waiting for this wild man to come out of the wilderness and preach to them. They've been waiting. They were in expectation. And all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Christ. And John answered them all, saying, I baptize you with water, but he who is mightier than I is coming. The strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. The Christ will bring a baptism of blessing and a baptism of judgment. That's what he told them. That's what they were expecting. Well, that's not what they were expecting, but that's what their expectation brought them to. They were expecting someone to come and rescue them. They saw this time. They've been waiting for this time their whole lives. And John tells them, this is why you need to repent. Because the one who comes after me, the Messiah, the chosen one, who the one who's going to rescue everyone, he will bring a, bl- a baptism of blessing and a baptism of judgment, a baptism of the Holy Spirit and a baptism of fire. In other words, the king is coming with his kingdom. The king is coming with his kingdom, and you can repent and join him, receiving all of his blessings, or you can resist and face the consequences. He said, the axe is already laid at the root. You can resist and face the consequences. Those are your options. That brings us to verse 18. So with many other exhortations, he preached good news to the people. 
But Herod the Tetrarch, who had been reproved by him for Herodias, his brother's wife, and for all the evil things that Herod had done, added this to them all, and he locked up John in prison. Just further, furthering the idea that no one was free from John's hellfire and brimstone preaching. Herod, the ruler of the region of Galilee, did not get a pass. John preached to him too. John was arrested and eventually killed for his honesty and fearlessness. He wanted people to know that God's son was coming and that he was going to set things right and they needed to be on board with him. And so we have the preparation for this in John the Baptist. We also have a proclamation from God about Jesus as God's son. Notice verses 21 and 22. Now when all the peoples were baptized... And when Jesus had also been baptized and was praying, the heavens were opened. So even Jesus comes to be baptized by John. Matthew's account teaches that it was to fulfill all righteousness. Okay, That's what Matthew says. Connecting Jesus' baptism in the Jordan with Israel's baptism in the Jordan and their, their failure to be what God asked them to be. Jesus is coming to fulfill all righteousness. Israel did not do that, but Jesus will. Jesus would be righteous and succeed where they failed. And the text says that the heavens were opened up. The veil between God's space and man's space was being momentarily lifted. I want you to think about that. You know, we think about sometimes heaven, you know, is like if, if I get in a rocket ship and I go far enough up there, you know, you know, you know, my... My Mimi, she's looking down on me up there, okay? Uh, you know, kind of thing like if, if you go far enough, you're going to find heaven. Now, heaven and earth are, are, are separated only as the, heaven is God's space, space, earth is our space, okay? And the, the Bible teaches in Revelation that those two will once again become one place, okay? In the beginning, God was with Adam and Eve. And now, uh, heaven and earth will come together in the end. And so, uh, what happens when Jesus is baptized? The heavens open up. Sort of, the veil is lifted, the curtain is opened. That veil between God's space and man's space was being momentarily lifted. And then there's an announcement. Notice verse 22. And the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven. You are my beloved son. With you I am well pleased. Here is this announcement. As if anybody there would doubt that this was Jesus, that this was the son of God, that this was the one who was to come and and, and change things. There is an announcement from heaven where God says, this is my son and I'm pleased with him. There's no doubt. I, I find this, this, uh, this expression of the Holy Spirit as a dove, I find it interesting. We have uh, other passages in Scripture uh, about doves. I've never seen anybody make this connection, uh, but I, I just can't help but think there's a connection here. Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, the Spirit of God was hovering on the face of the waters. Okay? The Spirit of God descends on Jesus. And then you have Genesis chapter 8, verse 11, After the flood, what bird, he sends out two birds, he sends out a raven and a dove, but what bird does God send out that indicates that there's going to be peace on earth after the flood? There's a dove. And he gets an olive branch, remember? I I can't help but think that there is a connection between these. The Holy Spirit is a a, a sign of, of God's coming peace to the world. Peace to the chaos. In the beginning, uh, the Holy Spirit, he, he brought peace to the chaos. He brought organization to the chaos of creation. And the, the, Holy, the, the, the dove, he came down and, and recognized that there was peace on earth finally after the flood. And the Holy Spirit descends on Jesus in the form of a dove, I think, to proclaim that God is coming to bring peace to the chaos of your lives. And God says, you are my beloved son, with you I am well pleased. Remember, God called Israel his son, Exodus 4, 22. 
but he was not ultimately pleased with him. In fact, Hosea chapter 11, verses 1 and 2 says, uh, he ca- called my son out of Egypt, but he kept running to the Baals. I called my son Israel out of Egypt, but they kept running to the Baals, to the idols. And so what God says is, this is my beloved son, I'm pleased with him, as if Israel did not please me. They did not do what I asked them to do. They had a rebellion problem, a sin problem, just as we all do. And so Jesus brings the blessing which God promised Abraham's family would bring to the whole world. He is the true born son of God who blesses the whole world with his peace. He blesses the whole world with his peace. And it's as if that's not enough. For, for Luke's readers, okay, the, 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 John the Baptist prepares the way and baptizes Jesus and calls him the Messiah, okay, the Lamb of God. Jesus is baptized, and when he's baptized, the Holy Spirit descends from heaven, and there's an announcement from heaven. This is my son. It's as if Luke says, okay, that's, that, that's not enough. I need to include something else. And so he includes <clears throat> a genealogy. He includes a genealogy of Jesus. Now, uh, so we see Jesus' progeny in this genealogy. Luke chapter 3, verses 23 through 38. Now, it's interesting. If you read this genealogy of Jesus and you read the genealogy in Matthew, they're very different. There's a lot of debate about this. You can read books and books and books upon books. Okay? There's a lot of theories as to why they're different. Uh, and I, we don't have time to go into those theories. But I think what is sufficient here is to notice verse 23, Jesus... And then notice verse 38, the Son of God. That's the point of this passage. Jesus, the Son of God. Okay, so there's all these names. I'm not going to go through them. You'll, you'll read them. You can read them sometime if you want to. Um, you know, you may want to get a dictionary and a Bible dictionary for all the pronunciation when you read them. Uh, or just if you do, you could just do like I do sometimes and go... Uh, Cool name, cool name, weird name. I mean, I, they're really hard to pronounce, okay? Uh, but I'll let you read those sometime. Okay? But have you ever counted them? Have you ever counted all the names? There are 77. There are 77. Did you know that 77 is a significant number in your Bible? Okay? Seven is a significant number, but 77 is an even more significant number. It's very significant. Now, normally, I don't like to talk about numerology when we talk about the Bible because people get weird with it. Y'all, I mean, y'all know what, we're, you know what people do. Like, they add up the numerical number of people's letters and their names, and, oh, that's the, the, that's, that's the Antichrist, and I, eh. All right. <laughs> uh, you can get real crazy and weird with that. But I do find this inter- interesting. 77 generations. Seven is considered the perfect number, and 77... Throughout Scripture seems to indicate a number beyond that, one of total and utter completion. Uh, Lamech, when he sings about, uh, in Genesis chapter 4, when he sings about uh, Cain, his, his uh, forefather, Cain's revenge was sevenfold. Lamech's revenge is 77-fold. Okay? Jesus tells his disciples, don't forgive seven times. Now, some versions say 70 times seven. Uh, but most modern translations say 77 times, okay, because this is a, a common saying throughout the Bible. Don't forgive seven times, forgive 77 times. Take it to utter completion. Jesus, the only Savior, the Son of God, has come to complete the grand plans that God has had throughout all generations. He is the completion, the 77th generation. He's come to finish everything. Now, the amazing thing about the story is that the New Testament later calls us back to the story to make it our story too. We too can be beloved children of the Father, royalty of the family of God, temples of the Holy Spirit. We too can be people, sons and daughters of God with whom God is pleased. We are called back to the story. And so as we read on, we're called back later to prepare our hearts through repentance the way that John the Baptist prepared the hearts of the people through repentance. Prepare your heart through repentance. If we're going to make this story our story, we have to prepare our hearts for repentance. We have to be willing to change. 
Have we changed who we are as people? Or are we still that old man or that old woman who hasn't changed and who refuses to change? Prepare your heart through repentance. And then uh, we're called back to the story to proclaim. Proclaim your need and desire for God through baptism. Proclaim your need and desire for God through baptism. In fact, 1 Peter 3.21 calls baptism an appeal to God for a good conscience. It is a, a, a proclaiming, God, I need you. I need your salvation. I need your help. I need you to wash away my sins. And God will call you his beloved, adopted, born again child. And then number three, realize your progeny in Christ. You are God's royal child. You are God's royal child. You're not an accident. You're not an animal. You are of the line of Jesus, adopted into the family of God. A child of God. And as such, you have an important role. You're royalty. I want to conclude today by looking at Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3, verses, verse 14. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14. For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven on earth is named. Okay? Part of salvation is realizing you're named after God. You are God's child. That according to the riches of His glory, He may grant you to be strengthened with power through His Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and what is the length and what is the height and what is the depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. We need to go into chapter 4. I therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. Here's the deal. You are royalty. If you have prepared your heart for repentance, if you have proclaimed your need for Christ and been baptized into Him, if you have done that, then you need to realize your progeny in Christ. You are royalty. You're not an animal. You're not a peasant. You're God's child. And there comes responsibility with that. Paul says, walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. I don't know where you are in this. Maybe you need to prepare your heart for repentance. Maybe you've never proclaimed your need for God and been baptized into Christ. Maybe you do not take seriously, maybe you've done those things and you do not take seriously your progeny in Christ. I want to offer you an invitation to do that today. We'd love to pray with you, talk with you, study with you. We have this invitation set aside for you today. If you need something, don't hesitate. Come sit up here on one of these front pews while we sing the song. Talk to someone privately in the back. Reach out to me, whatever it is that you need. Don't hesitate. Come as we stand and sing.